Okay, thanks. Um, many of you knew um, during a lot of years, and I don't have s specific statistics, but Tom Allen served on this committee for many years. Uh, he was a chairman of this committee for a good number of years. Tom Allen passed away this past weekend. Um, he, had, he had cancer and it had gotten fairly advanced and, and uh, he's been through a lot of, a lot of treatments and, but a lot of pain and, and um, he's, um, uh, I, I visited yesterday afternoon with his, with his wife and his family. Uh, the funeral is this morning at 10 o'clock, but uh, uh, Tom Allen made a difference on this committee and, uh, and in the engineering community. Um, he worked for 20 years for the Corps of Engineers um, doing hydraulic and hydrologic modeling. And when, when Tom showed up at my office, even after he was at, off of this committee, um, it was because there was a complex, tricky uh, flood model involved, and, and Tom was a, was a master. Tom, in addition to serving on this committee, often represented clients before this committee, and, um, and we just have the highest of regard for Tom and his service um, to the engineering community and, and just because he was just a great man, so. Served for a very long time. It was before me, but served for a very long time on this committee. So we thank him. Well, just you guys served with him. I did. I mean, yeah. I, I, Tom was a great engineer, but he's also a great person. Um, he was just a kind spirit and kind soul, and I'm sure he'll be rewarded for that. Yeah, likewise, I, I had a chance to appear before the committee as an applicant uh, when Tom was chairman, and he was such a gentleman and patient and always kind in his uh, interactions with uh, the public and he was a real model public servant so he'll be missed all right thank you so with that uh let's move uh to the first request on the agenda uh it is uh oh well, go ahead actually you know what let's read the read the statement into the uh, record please Penny. Our opening statement to the applicant. If you're not satisfied with the decision made by the Stormwater Management Committee, you may appeal the decision by filing for a writ of centurion with the Davidson County Chancery or Circuit Court. Your appeal must be filed within 60 days of the date of the committee's decision. You are advised to seek the independent advice of legal counsel to ensure that your appeal is filed in a timely manner and that all procedural requirements have been satisfied. Thank you. And applicant, you've got everybody here you need here. Uh, if we could have staff uh, read a short summary of the applicant's request, please. So this is for Stormwater Management Committee number 2019-00014, Racetrack Petroleum at 930 Rivergate Parkway. Uh, it's Council District 10. The inspector for MPDS is Boots O'Hara, and it's parcel number 03020109000. The applicant's request is to allow the following. Number one, buffer disturbance for sidewalk and parking lot. Number two, storm structures in the buffer. Number three, uncompensated fill in the floodplain. The appellant is Racetrack Petroleum Incorporated. The representative is Levi Shira from Gresham Smith & Partners. Comments. Uh, Stormwater staff, Metro Water Services recommends that the site be designed to have a no rise. A rise was observed within the submitted materials. Codes has no comment. Planning site is zoned for uh, CS, deferred to stormwater for review. Greenways defers to decision of the Stormwater Management Committee. Thank you. With that, we'll turn it over to the applicant for presentation. Good morning. I'm Levi Shiver, the engineer of record for the site development of this project. To my immediate right is Matt McLaren with Gresham Smith. He is the engineer of record for the flood study and will be able to speak on that behalf. And then to his right is Alan Bell from Racetrack Petroleum out of Atlanta. So as Courtney stated, we do have three requests. Um, one is buffer disturbance, one is storm structures, 
in the buffer, and then the last is uncompensated fill in the floodplain. Um, I'm gonna go what I feel is easiest to hardest. I think that the uncompensated fill in the floodplain will lead to some discussion down the road. Um, so with meetings with Public Works and due to the major collector street plan, we're having to repave the sidewalk uh, to incorporate a grass strip that is going to get into the buffer disturbance along Rivergate Parkway and Gallatin. We're still working with Public Works along with the sidewalk on Rivergate. We have the um, required right-of-way dedication that we need, but the sidewalk does not have a grass strip, and we're, we're still discussing trying to keep that sidewalk as it stands right now. But um, from previous experience, we're expecting to have to repave some of that sidewalk, if not all of it, to incorporate some sort of grass strip. So we're going to go ahead and ask for um, a variance to do that. The small green triangle up to the right is also in the buffer. That is currently a paved parking lot. And we're just asking to repave that and change the grade slightly to promote drainage into the creek and allow for a curb cut. The second issue is head walls in the buffer. We will need to um, enter the buffer on the south side and tie into the existing box culvert, which is in the stream buffer. And we'll also will need a head wall on the north end of the buffer to just charge the north end of the site up there. The last issue is uncompensated fill in the floodplain. In November of this past year, Racetrack entered into a closed bid situation to buy this property. During that closed bid, there was a small due diligence period in which we provided Racetrack with a site plan and a grading plan, which is close to what you see now. We researched um, the floodplain for this area during that due diligence period and this parcel or any parcel adjacent to this was not in any sort of 100-year floodplain from FEMA, and it was not on any FEMA preliminary study list that is readily available for public information. It, on February 25th, 2019, we had a pre-application meeting with codes and stormwater Courtney Larson was present, and after the meeting, we, re we received correspondence from her that there was a local flood study on this portion of the property, and that the majority of the property that Racetrack now owned was within the 100-year floodplain. It is important to note that Racetrack purchased the checkers, which is currently on the site, and we plan to keep the checkers as is after this racetrack is developed. After Courtney notified us of the floodplain, we met with Roger Lindsay on March 7th, and he requested that this study serve as a basis of design for this site. After a meeting with Roger Lindsay, um, we sat down with FEMA to get a better understanding of the study and request their model. And it was our understanding that this study um, was submitted to FEMA, but FEMA has not provided any comments to the Corps or Metro at the time of the meeting. Um, the Corps also stated that they, at this time, do not know if FEMA is going to accept this study in its entirety or certain parts of this study. On the 27th of March, we met with Steve Michoud and Rebecca for a pre-application meeting, and we discussed possible avenues of cut fill compensation, and it's their request that the open ditch area we leave alone, and we do not provide any mitigation within the um, that open ditch area, whether it be trees for additional planting or additional cut in that area. 
So as far as compensation, we don't have any additional area on site with the site plan that we um, provided for racetrack. We're pinched on the west side because of the checkers is staying as is and the majority of our property is within the two-year floodplain as well. Um, so we're asking for um, uncompensated fill about 590 cubic yards. We ran a flood study on that and it has a slight rise of 0 0.09 feet. I know in the hardship letter I put 2.2 .2 feet, but that was a mistake by me. Um, we're actually less than a tenth of a foot rise um, on the downstream side of the property. And I'm gonna turn it over to Matt McLaren to talk about the modeling of the study. Yep. Thank you all so very much for your time this morning. As Levi stated, the Corps was kind enough to provide us the model for us to start as a, um, a baseline for our work. I took the Corps' model and, oh, perfect. So um, in the area of the project, there are three existing cross sections which are located between the culverts under Gallatin and Rivergate. I took that and revised the ground geometry from top of bank to the right. I left everything within the channel and everything to the left as is. I did not change any of the cues, any Manning's ends, or any of that data. I strictly updated the top of bank to the right with our field run topo, and then also with our proposed condition, and reran the model. The intent was to keep it as simple of an update as possible, as this was actively being reviewed by FEMA and did not want to create any other issues within that review process. By making those changes, as Levi stated, there is a slight rise downstream of the property over Gallatin of 0 0.9, and there is a slight decrease upstream of the property of also about a tenth of a foot. Um, happy to get into the details, but that's the basis of what the report was, um, and happy to answer any questions you have about it. I have a question, I guess. <clears throat> Since you said you added cross sections to this, use the same for sections? We use the same sections so, that the core had. Okay, so use the same section as, as the core. So what caused this rise then? Um, it, just any time you change the ground lines, mm -hmm. it, I, I couldn't tell you exactly what caused it. Well, if you didn't have this uncompensated fill, would have, I mean, did you run your model without that? Or do we know that, that it's a result of the, of the 590 cubic yards? Or is it is the result of some other factor? I couldn't. A roughness remember. factor or whatever. I, I did not change any of the roughness okay. factors. It's paved today. It's going to be paved at the end of the day. Um, I, I couldn't tell you if I went back and I changed the ground exactly to something else. Um, I ran the model with the proposed grading we have. One of the real challenges with this is by elevating the building out of the flood elevation, mm -hmm. and then you have to maintain ADA access out of the building across the pumps, we're really fixed vertically on what we can do. Uh, that, that's really where the challenge is, is I don't have a lot of play with the grading. So I ran it with what we really have to have. Um, usually I would go back and I'd play with a lot of the grades and see what I could do to get rid of that. Um, one of the other challenges was it's not an effective model yet. Um, so I, I'm not real sure how the, the rise actually plays out in a Let, model that's currently. Let's, 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 let's finish up with the public comments. Okay, well, we'll come back. He, yeah. he volunteered to answer right. questions. That's why I asked. No, yeah, so. I know. Okay. You're just trying to All follow right. with what he asked. Right. So with, with, is, that, is the applicant done with this presentation? Okay, with that, let's, let's see if we have any comments either in opposition to or in favor of uh, the request uh, from the public. Is there anyone here to speak in opposition um, to the request? Seeing none, is anyone here to speak in favor of the request? Seeing none there either. All right, then right back to us. And, and let's, <laughs> a lot of people here. So. Yeah, no, uh, I know, that's what I, I figured we might have someone who might have seen something. So, so, so Doc, go ahead with your question. There's something special about this intersection. <laughs> Roy, I'm <laughs> sorry. <laughs> so well, does, I'm looking right over you. Does the staff have any kind of uh, response as far as the review of their model? 
nothing else. Well, I'll let Roger speak to that. This one is, is somewhat tricky <clears throat> in that you've heard the description of when these models were actually completed and submitted to us for our review. Because in the course of over the last 10 or 11 years or so, we've done a, a, a massive amount of new modeling and new mapping. We had new maps that were adopted by the city council in April of 2017. That constituted 150 map panels. But we continue, there was a whole nother phase of Corps of Engineers um, uh, study work that was, uh, was on our books to, to complete. And in fact, a week ago Monday, we had a meeting with Region 4 FEMA and the Corps of Engineers and AECOM, AECOM being the consultant that the Corps, that Region 4 FEMA uses to actually develop new maps. And they dropped on our desks 60 new map panels uh, covering all of the different phases of work that were scheduled to be done, or one phase. Phase four, as it's identified in our, uh, our records, um, so we, we're, we're looking at, over the next year to year and a half, the adoption of 60 modified panels. These are 60 panels that were reissued as new maps in April of 17, but there were, there were a good number of smaller tributaries. And this tribute, this is what, Turkey Gizzard Creek? Is that the, the name of it? Uh, Turkey Gizzard, Gizzard Creek is a relatively small tributary to the Cumberland River, uh, Rivergate Mall being located very close to the Cumberland River. And Turkey Gizzard, uh, I believe, is just south of Dry Creek. Um, and it was, a, it was a reach of creek, a small reach, um, in, a, in a very congested developed area, the whole Rivergate Mall area and all the outlying commercial uh, parcels around the mall itself, but all you know, across the road. And there are three different tribs that break loose, break out of the, the, the Turkey Gizzard upstream at this point. And, and there's just commercial development all over those. Those, um, those small tribs to Turkey Gizzard. Uh, and it's just a, it's a, it's a reach of creek that is, is significantly impacted by the amount of development that has occurred over, over decades of time in the, in the development of that mall. So. Is that, is that why it backs up floodplain or is this coming up from the river? I, I, don't, I don't know, I'm not familiar enough hydraulically. I don't mystery. believe it's, I, I don't think it's impacted by backwater at this point in the, Creek. Now, a lot of, there are a lot of trips to the Cumberland that are impacted by backwaters from the Cumberland when the Cumberland is at base flood elevation. But it's not, not at the point of, of the mall. It's not, not impacted by backwaters. So this is water coming? <clears throat> it's water draining from that area through that. Is it that. south? Is it going down? It's going, it's going to the south and okay. east toward the river. And so it's, it's, it's coming. So more is coming across Rivergate than what can go out. Gallatin. And it's constrained and by up this parking lot? much of the flow in that area is constrained by box, long box culverts, uh, long conveyances. The short, there's a small segment of open creek that's identified right at the corner of this site. And I wasn't aware that that um, uh, racetrack had actually purchased the checkers because you know when you look at the checkers would never be built today. It, it's it's clearly in the, in, the, in the edge of the floodway and totally in the zone one buffer and partially in zone two buffer. It's just really a, in a bad place. And Courtney, who lives in that area, has seen it probably waist deep in that checkers more than once. She's, she's seen it, the checkers flooded a couple of times. Um, so It's not elevated? It's an area, no, it's, who knows? I, Courtney, do you have any? Uh, it is not elevated. It's sitting at grade, the whole parking lot. I mean, it's all basically at the same grade. And checkers is waist deep? It's, it flooded Gallatin Road there, and they had to close the intersection in some areas. And the checkers is right at or slightly below the elevation of the road. So it, it has flooded that intersection in Gallatin Pike. The, as Roger alluded water to. Water over the road. Water okay. over the road. Uh, closing of the intersection. I mean... Yeah, I, I wasn't out in it, so I can't speak if it was waist deep, but it was definitely flooding over the road. Uh, and then there are constrictions with, with the uh, structure that goes under Gallatin and the downstream. Uh, that's There's a Walgreens and a wholesale auto on the other side, and there's constrictions there as well. So it's not just going under Gallatin. It's it's beyond that. It's restricted. I would think it's beyond that. Beyond that, yes, sir. 
And because we've not had a model and a map on this reach of creek before, we don't really have a lot of, of, of historical understanding of, of, of where a lot of the issues are in the, in the creek below. Now, to the point that I made the comment about the meeting that we had a week ago Monday, um, we've got new draft, 60 new draft maps, many of them containing segments of creeks that have not been modeled and mapped before. Uh, we're into beginning the process of starting to look at those panel by panel. Uh, we've not had the opportunity yet to really delve into that. Uh, but we, we will, over the coming months, complete a review of those work maps, and then we will, uh, FEMA will issue a new set of preliminary maps. And there's a, there's a well-defined process that you go through with FEMA to, to complete reviews of preliminary maps. Uh, including some public meetings, and, and we always invite impacted uh, uh, parcel owners uh, to the pre preliminary map uh, public meetings. We had multiple public meetings here in this room um, prior to the issuance of the April 7, 2017 maps. Uh, then they'll go into a process whereby the, the city council will, will adopt those, and then there's a 180-day period before they become new effective panels. So 60 new panels over the next year to year and a half will we'll be um, making some new changes. So, so this is one of those creeks that's included in this. And um, there'll be additional staff review and discussions with the Corps over their modeling, discussions with FEMA uh, over their mapping. Um, so it's, it's a little bit of a, it's, it's kind of at an inopportune time for this, this whole site and, this, and the purchase of this property. But it's, it's a floodway, and it's a complicated floodway because of the amount of development that exists in that area. <clears throat> Thank you. Part of, I think, too, the staff's uh, concern was, um, Terry, if Terry, um, in the ordinance itself, there's the language relative to, you know, construction yeah. that causes a rise. Yeah, um, so what I was looking at is actually in the Metropolitan Code itself. It's section 1564.120. All construction, whether by private or public action, shall be performed in such a manner as to A, have no material increase in the degree of flooding in its vicinity or in other areas, whether by flow restrictions, increased runoff, or by diminishing retention capacity, B, have no adverse impact for site design, including, but not limited to, no rise in the 100-year base flood elevations on any project or development located in a documented floodplain as a result of development. So my concern is that at least B applies here, and if it does, then this is not a candidate for a variance as to that because this committee cannot grant variances from provisions of the code itself. Thank you. That goes into my next question, which was, did I hear it right that based on the applicant's data, that they've got to add some, some they're going to take away some storage, and in fact, it's going to increase the flood elevation. And that's what that was my original question. I didn't know if when the staff looked at this, there's got to be a reason why it's, there's a rise. And what is the, there is a rise, right? There, there is a rise. I mean, if, if, if the applicant stated he didn't change any of the roughness coefficients mm -hmm. or any of the mannings or whatever it is for the for the side banks, my my initial guess it it just has to be because of the uncompensated. Uh, exactly. That that's why I was trying to get you to say and instead of me to say that. <laughs> so, but that's, I think there's also something else here that that Steve, you may have more knowledge about this than anyone else. So this is one large parcel of land right now, and you're in essence redeveloping this parcel. Is there something in our code or something in the zoning ordinance that when you redevelop a piece of property that you have to come in compliance with other things that, that exist within the site itself? Well, so they submitted a plat for this to, to subdivide property, and um, that's, that's another layer of the onion that we kind of flagged as far as buffers, and uh, there is not a provision that they have to make the checkers in compliance with the floodplain ordinance today. <coughs> If they were to redevelop the, the checkers or do enough interior work to a checkers to amount to significant redevelopment, we would make them either raise it up to today's standards or floodproof to today's standards. So if they were going to do tear the roof off, put a new roof on, redo, then they may be into that area. So are, is there anything going to happen to this checkers? Is it going to stay as it is? Do you know? It, it's going to yeah, stay as it is. Okay. okay. <clears throat> and I, I do want to bring up a point that. Um, we feel that 
this is not a documented floodplain at this time because this floodplain has not gone for public comment and been adopted by FEMA. What is, from a legal counsel, how's that pertain? Because it says floodplain? It does, it says documented floodplain in the code language that I was reading to you. Um, all construction, whether by private or public action, shall be performed in such a manner as to have no adverse impact for site design, including but not limited to no rise in the 100-year base flood elevations on any project or development located in a documented floodplain as a result of development. Um, so documented floodplain is not a defined term okay. in the code. Floodplain is a defined term in the code. but So, so I think historically, if we were to develop a piece of property that wasn't a defined floodplain, but the applicant did a flood study and determined a floodplain, I think it becomes a documented floodplain at that point. I, that's what I would think. So the fact that they've done this and they've identified a 100-year flood elevation, to me, I think that means it's documented. There is, as well, to your point, um, Mr. Dale, that, that um, FEMA has a whole guidance document on the use of best available data, and, and this is a, a, a Corps of Engineers model that's been produced and, and exists as data layers within our GIS map. Um, and so we will, going forward, uh, enforce to uh, w what we have as, as the only basis for a model and the GIS map becomes, um, you know, you, we would be remiss if we ignored the existence of this floodplain to any new developer that walked in and said, I want to put a building down here next to the creek. We, we would, and we've done it over the, during the period of time that the last issuance of maps, the 2017 maps, uh, we looked at those as, as best available data. It's, it's data that didn't exist prior to the, the model being prepared by the Corps of Engineers. And, and so to the extent that if, if the results of that model and the mapping as it goes through the work map stage and the preliminary map stage, as, as it goes through that process, if it's more conservative than, well, than data we've had previously, we will enforce to that more conservative level. If it's less conservative, if, if, if it says, oh, the floodplain drops, we're not going to administer a drop in a floodplain, in a, especially if you're comparing against a, another map, an older map. We're not going to, until they become effective maps. So it's, there's kind of a, a process that involves, you know, these, the, the timing of getting these, these various levels of reviews completed and leading us all the way up to the point of adopting those maps by the city council when they become effective flood insurance rate maps. Thank you. A few more questions. So um, the access on Rivergate Parkway, is that over an existing box culvert? Are you using, utilizing an existing box culvert? Okay, and then this pipe that comes off the back that you're showing that's going into the buffer, what is the size of that? Do you know what the size of that pipe actually is? I think proposed? it's 18 okay. to 24, somewhere in that realm. Did it have to come at this point in order to reach daylight? Is that why it's Yes, been? yes. Okay. And, and one thing I did exclude was we, we submitted to exhibits um, 2A and 2B, and I know that's a little bit confusing. Um, one of those showed LID and one of them assumed we might get a LID waiver, which we did get an LID waiver. Um, so we're using the 2B map. And I believe that that northern pipe that you're talking about, because we're not, we don't have buyer retention anymore, we might be able to get out of that buffer. Okay. I think that would be good. So when will you find out whether or not you're going to have to go to the grass strip or not on the sidewalk? Is there some process um, you're going through? Yes, or we'll submit something formally to Public Works um, probably within the next week, depending on the outcome of this meeting. Okay. Well, um, and there, there are a couple... The sidewalk's a little bit messy, too, because along Rivergate, that was going to be a TDOT project that um, our transportation group was designing, and I think some of the funds have gone away, fallen through with TDOT, so we're trying to, to figure out, do we design that, what TDOT wanted, or do we design it to Metro Public, uh, the major collector street plan, because they're drastically different, and so there's we have a couple coordination issues with sidewalks that we're still 
working through, but we're anticipating having to do some sidewalk work within those buffers. Okay, and um, would it be fair to say that based upon the results of what comes back from public works that could affect your variance or the extent of your variance? Um, I don't think it's gonna be anything worse than the area that we're proposing right now. I think the only thing we're asking for worst case scenario, right. best but it case be better. is, yeah. It could be better. So I mean, from my perspective, um, I, th I think there's some tweaks that, I mean, I think every, there's no one here that's against development. I don't think that's gonna be the case. I think we all like redevelopment. And this you know, property is a really good prime candidate. Uh, I just feel like that there's some small tweaks that could be made to make this plan work. Um, I think you can probably go back and do some modification on your flood study in some manner. Um, the green area that you're showing here, this triangle, mm -hmm. I don't think part of that area has to be paved. Um, and so from my perspective, I don't think I could support your variance right now because I think there's improvements that could be made. I'd like to, um, I'd like to revisit uh, the third point about the rise. Um, um, you know, the main issue here seems to be whether or not we even should be addressing this as a variance. I, I think that needs to be settled first. And, and or then, we it down. Or, or, or we could, but uh, I mean, you know, what, what concerns me is that, you know, um, we, we have a lot of legal precedents around making sure that applicants understand the expectations of regulations, ex expectations of public policy, so they don't waste their time. And so they come before a committee like this with a reasonable opportunity to be heard and, and to have a, a, a reasonable expectation that it could go either way, that it's not gonna be a, a, a closed shut case. So, um, so I, you know, I think we need to make clear that this type of situation is either in or out for a variance in this case. So future applicants will not spend this kind of time. But secondly, I, I, I wanna ask a quick question. This is just a curiosity. When, when did you all decide to buy the Checkers property? It was uh, November of 2018, so this, somewhere in that time frame. So this was after you had owned the property for a long period of time? Or? No, no, we, we, it, was a, it was a closed bid process. So you bought the entire parcel at the same time? Right, with the Checkers lease existing. Okay. Okay. So, okay. and then the due diligence, as Levi mentioned, okay. there, was a, there was a FEMA firm map that was April of 2017, I believe, so okay. pretty okay. recent data that we okay. base that decision okay. on. Okay, so I, I guess what I'm trying to figure out is, you know, was there some kind of reasonable sign that this was not gonna work out? But, um, so anyway, so can, can we settle the issue of whether or not this should even be heard first no, that's before a legal, we vote on it? That's a legal question. I'm not sure we can settle that in the court. But, but my, what I'd like to ask is, I wanna make sure I got this straight. You're asking me to approve the redevelopment of this property in a manner that causes an increased flooding at the intersection of Gallatin and um, Rivergate. Is, is that what you're asking me to do? It does have a slight rise just downstream of the property. I don't, let's just vote. I'm, I'm sorry, I've not seen anyone approve that request since I've been on this panel for a long time. So if they were it's to as go easy as that, I mean, I just don't. Yeah, I, I think that part of our issue and why we're here too is there is a flood study out there that, in our opinion, is not documented because it is not readily available to the public, and it's not been vetted by the public. I, and, and that's and, fine. And so from that perspective, you could come and say, okay, look, we think it's wrong because of this, and we don't think we're going to cause a rise. I mean, that that would be the argument, not. It's, it's not official yet, but we're gonna increase road flooding. Yeah, am I missing something? I just think that if they used the same exact sections, and you ran the sections, and that was your base elevation you started from, then you put your proposed in, it was a slight rise. There's got to be a way, somehow, for you to make this work. I just, I just, I just have to believe that. And, and then you won't be asking for that, and you'll only be asking for encroachments that are probably gonna be something we can deal with. Uh, within the buffers. Yeah, I would uh, agree I with think, that. I think that this site, based upon what they're doing, they're probably gonna improve the water quality more than it is today, because there's nothing there. There's a big parking lot. So I think from our perspective, which we're a water quality board, really, that's what we are, uh, I think that that would be fine. But we can't approve something that causes a rise. We can't do it. Can, and, and, yeah, but they're, they're also introducing well, they're, petroleum to the site, so, you know. Uh, 
that's been a consideration the past two. Yeah. Okay. If if we can do this without a rise, does it have to come before the board again? If you're, if you're going to have buffers. yeah, if you're encroaching the buffers. But it, what but, it, but what we're saying is that most likely because of the location of this property, your redevelopment, that it's coming in the buffer is not going to be something that we just can't entertain. The, the rise at this intersection is something that I just don't think it's going to be entertained at all. Okay. Can we, um, is it possible to, well, can I have one minute to talk to our client? Certainly. Yeah. You can defer. That's what you're about to ask. You're allowed to defer for 30 days. Or Chairman? Yes. If they were to go back and, and find a way not to make a rise, but they ask for uncompensated fill, then they would still have to come back either way. That's true. Yeah, the, it's the compensated so. fill that would, so if you still have uncompensated fill, you have to come back. But it's different if you're saying there's not going to be a rise in the flooding. If you're able to do it in a way that shows no rise, that's different, at least from our perspective and consideration. It, would it would it be possible to kind of kind of table the the uncompensated fill, but but go ahead and act on the the buffers? Today? No, it's not because we have to approve the the plan as is. Under that under these specific circumstances, you're asking for that's not a possibility. Okay. And I'd almost rather have your response from Storm from Public Works on what you're going to do with the sidewalks too. I mean, I, I'd like to know that. Okay, then I think um, if it's okay with you all, we're just going to defer and then come back at a later date in a couple months. So the applicants asked for a deferment, and I have to ask this every time because I forget. Is that something we vote for? Yes. <laughs> okay, so there's been a request for a deferment. Is that for two months is what he's asked for. Is that something we can do? Um, I think it's 30 days. Um, oops, sorry. Um, we can vote on it. It says, at the, the conclusion of all the evidence in all cases heard at the hearing session, the committee shall discuss the cases and render decisions in executive session on that date or defer decisions for no longer than 30 days thereafter. So, so, so but, 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 come back but is there a difference? Us. So that's like if the committee, well, I guess we would be voting. Uh, well, that's if awesome. the applicant volunteers, it's still the same thing. Yeah, I don't know. That's what the, the way that reads is if we decide. Yeah, if we decide a, an executive committee. I, that, I think most likely the applicant can do because we can yeah. vote right now to defer right. it. Then the applicant itself could, could push it another month. I, I, I am worried if we want to look into public works, getting a decision in 30 days is highly unlikely. I believe that we can give you a 30-day deferral, and then if you work out with public works where you're not on the actual next hearing, you're on the one after that, we don't have anything to say about that. Exactly. So, okay. okay. All right, so with that, I'd like to make a motion that we defer this, 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 this decision on okay. this matter for 30 days. I second that motion. All right. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor of the deferral, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Seeing none, it passes. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay, now we have a, another matter on the agenda, and this is the approval of um, modifications uh, to the Storm Water Services Storm Water User Fee Credit <coughs> Manual that was uh, last uh, that was dated February of 2016 as of last issued, uh, and so there are some proposed uh, modifications. Uh, to that manual that the new manual will be dated October 2019. Uh, this is going to be the public hearing session on those changes. Do we have um, any kind of summary from the staff other than what I've just provided, which is certainly these are the proposed changes? <laughs> I didn't know you were going to be the one providing the summary, Roger. The stormwater user fee went into effect in 2009. And during the course of that process, we elected to establish an opportunity to provide for credits, um, predominantly for either commercial, well, not, not predominantly, we felt like with an average of a $3 a month stormwater user fee for a residential user, we weren't, we weren't offering credits to residential um, uh, users of the, of, the, uh, of the fee. 
So it goes to commercial credits for, for, for commercial installations that had, had spent a lot of time and effort and money building state-of-the-art stormwater control facilities, both, both quantity, detention basins, and so forth, or quality, the purchase of a $100,000 water quality unit, those kinds of things that went into uh, spending money to meet our regulations relative to the, our stormwater handling, quantity, quality. And so we said uh, that if you do those things and you apply and you document that you're maintaining your facility, that you're entitled to apply for uh, detention credits, which is up to 20% of your, your fee, or a quality credit, up to 20%. Uh, there was a provision for education credits for educational inst institutions like Vanderbilt University or any of the other universities. Um, and in some cases, I think even some churches have investigated the use of an education credit. Um, and then in 2012, as we, as we sought to encourage um, stormwater controls to consider low impact development, it was not mandated during those first two years. Recall that we, we had a voluntary program that encouraged people to, in a commercial facility, to, to, to try some LID and see how it worked. And that was before it went into effect as part of our regulations as being a mandatory or required component of stormwater handling. Um, so in that first, on page one of the, of the, the document you've got, um, it shows a, that initially there was a low impact development credit of up to 75% uh, uh, indicated in that manual. Well, that was, that was an encouragement. It was set that way during those years when it was not a mandatory requirement and as a means of encouraging people to give it a try and see how it worked, we set that as a level. Well, it's, it's a mandatory requirement now. It shouldn't be handled any different than any other uh, stormwater um, uh, fee as it's calculated and charged and, and as we collect it. So that just needs to come out completely. And that's probably one of the, that's one of the, of the, the, the real dominant components of change in this document. Uh, the other thing is that as we as we had conversations and discussions with large, larger educational institutions like Vanderbilt University, um, identifying a way to effectively manage this education credit, we felt like as staff we felt like um, certainly if you had if you had 50 parcels on your property, and only a handful of them were classroom buildings uh, um, that that. You know, our, our agreement that the application of this credit applied to where you taught your little stormwater um, uh, orientation classes that met the needs, the requirements of, of meeting the requirements for a stormwater credit for education. Um, we weren't going to give you credits for parking garages. Felt like it made no sense to say that we would give an education credit for the medical center side of Vanderbilt because they're not teaching stormwater over there. Um, so it became a real exercise to try to figure out how we could most appropriately identify parcels that were entitled to an education credit. And uh, in efforts with, um, with a couple of, of the folks um, uh, in our um, at Metro Water Administration, we began to identify ways that Vanderbilt, for example, again, to, could, could document that they were doing things that went to the education side of stormwater. And they include a lot of exercises of, even in parking garages, that they would, that the, that the university would schedule regular exercises to do trash pickup, uh, trash pickup in parking lots, for example. Uh, well, we know they're not teaching classes in a parking lot, but on a, on a Sunday afternoon after a, a ball game, uh, there's probably a, a, a buku trash that needs to be picked up on parking lots and things like that. Uh, cleaning trash out of parking garages, those kinds of things. So, so we established and identified in um, some of the, the uh, latter pages of this document ways that, um, that a, an educational institution could find ways to do things that we felt like uh, went to the whole process of, of, um, of education about stormwater. So, and and Rod, Roger, if I yes. might. One thing that might be helpful to the committee, and I know I spoke to, to Rebecca about this yesterday, if maybe you could just briefly uh, orient the committee about the current level of participation in this program. I think you said yesterday six sites. We have six. 
We have six, six permit holders, essentially, that, that, um, that take advantage of the educational credit. So it's not a vast number, um, but um, to those that do, and, and to larger institutions like Vanderbilt, um, it, it's, it makes a difference. So, so it's, it's just another one of those documents that we like to keep updated. I know there's another section where it referenced a, a maintenance form that is handled somewhere else that really doesn't need to be in here. So. Um, it's just another one of those things that we need to update from time to time, and we have to follow a formal right. process that, that the committee is used to. And typically, that. if we've got a, a, an, inst an institution that, that holds grading permits, they, they've already signed maintenance agreements, and those are on file in the Register of Deeds, and, and we have, we know we have through, um, um, through our, our ordinances, uh, we have right of entry, so we, we took out those components of this document. So. An attempt to simplify the document a little bit, but but not to, to reduce uh, our need to, to have things like right of entry to do inspections. Um, it was always important that, that there was a maintenance component to these credits. We didn't want to just issue a credit to somebody, uh, to, a, to, to a mall, for example, uh, that was applying for a, a, a detention or a, a quant quantity or quality um, uh, credit that the, the, we never looked to, to make sure they were keeping their facilities, keeping their, uh, the trash out of their detention ponds or the, or the trees cut out of their detention ponds or, or that they were actually contracting with a company that came on an annual basis and, and, and vacuumed out their, their um, stormwater filtration units, those kinds of things. So if they were applying for such a credit, then they had to, com they had to comply with the um, uh, and, and be subject to the inspection of those facilities to make sure they were being properly maintained. And maybe one other thing for the committee, Maxine is here today, I guess she's the person that handles all of those things through working with Roger um, and is the person that I understand processes all of those. So. Right. So that's Thank why you. that's why Maxine looks so interested back there. So she, <laughs> there's a young lady back there that's really interested in what's going on. So uh, it's usually us geeky guys and, and gals. And she has heard she has heard it all. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it, yeah, when I, I'm used to looking out at audiences of, of young people and and looking for interest or disinterest in my well, classroom. Well, this so I can spot this, this being the public this being a public hearing, we need to open it up to the public on any any so. Do we have anybody here to speak either in favor of the um, proposed changes or in opposition to the proposed changes? All right, seeing none. Correct. We've done our public hearing duty. Um, so for adopting regulations, you're required to, um, prior to adoption, publish the regulations and public comment has to be able to be received and considered on them. Okay, and this so is that they opportunity. They were um, published on the Metro website um, and, and linked to the notice of this meeting so that people would know that this was their opportunity to appear and comment on them. Or I suppose they could have submitted written comments in anticipation of the meeting. Okay. Thank you. Um, and then, and yes. just, to, just to kind of close that loop from our last discussion, Maxine Stevenson, if you don't know Maxine, she, she handles every call that comes to Metro uh, about stormwater user fees, not just this credit manual and things like that, but she does a lot of work. Um, uh, she sits right outside my office and she does a lot of work uh, in the evaluating questions, uh, measuring impervious surface on sites, uh, responding to uh, both both pleasant and angry uh, customers of our of our process, um, it's a it's a, a really now that we've been in place for for over ten years, it's it's been a very productive uh, program. The stormwater user fee it it um, provides us with with opportunities to do corrective work on drainage systems and and uh, even even to. Uh, some matches for for floodplain buyouts and things like that. Uh, the the, re the revenues that come from our stormwater user fee um, cannot be understated. It it makes a big difference for us. Thank you and thank you, Maxine. Um, 
we don't have to vote on this. This was just an opportunity, or do we? You do have to. We do. I'm sorry, you do have to approve. We're the body it that approves. The, yes. Okay. So we're the body that approves uh, these changes. Uh, any discussion uh, among the panel about the proposed changes or motions? Yeah, I just want to ask one quick question. Uh, evidently, some people do know about this and read the public notice because I got an email about it. Um, so I got a quick question for Roger, uh, just just for the public record kind of aspect of this. Are there any changes here that you feel like are going to make it harder for you all to encourage people to go beyond, you know, our standards and regulations? Uh, nothing related to the to, to the credit manual, I think. All right, thank you. All right, move we accept the recommended changes. Got a motion to uh, approve uh, the proposed changes. I'll second it. And a second. So the motion on the table to approve the proposed changes. Any discussion on the proposed changes? Seeing none, all in favor of approving the proposed changes, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Seeing none, they're approved. Thank you so much for your work on that. Um, now we're to new business. Mr. Chairman, if if I might. Oh, it's, I know. It's a little strange. I'm not used to being this loud. Um, it, if I might, I wanted to address Mr. Galbert's question during the first uh, hearing today, because it is a point that staff has considered over time. Obviously, our regulations involve various state and federal regulations, at which point there can be a legal question is it even eligible for a variance? Um, I think it fair to say that in internal discussions where we have landed on that generally is that it is best to let that proceed to the committee. These cases are generally complicated and like the one you saw today, there are various elements to the requests and there is some inherent benefit to the applicant to go ahead and be able to air the full case and to be able to air all of the particulars. So uh, while it might appear it's a dead end to come for something that's not eligible, I think as we saw today, there can be elements of the case covered, direction given that gives them a path forward, and even administratively as it relates to what their next pass and, and relief might be, I think it is a necessary step and appears to be. So I just wanted to make that statement in that it is something staff considers, but. Uh, you know, there might be a certain case that comes through where we do decide to go ahead and say really legally that's not possible. But I think for the vast majority of cases, we would deem it appropriate in working together on these to, uh, to let them come forward to the committee. And we're always open for feedback on that as well. Yeah, and, and, and I appreciate that. And, you know, due process and the opportunity to be heard is a fundamental American right. It's one of the most amazing things about our system. Uh, and uh, and I, 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 I'm confident you all help applicants understand what might waste their time and what might not waste their time. Uh, the applicant clearly wanted to be here. Hope is an amazing, you know, contagious thing <laughs> when it comes to people wanting to present their case. Um, along that line, um, this is just kind of a, a general comment related to our discussion in, in the last meeting about the state appeals court case a briefing that we received. Um, and what, what triggered this thought was the applicant's reference to his hardship letter, uh, their hardship letter. Um, 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 this is a similar sentiment to the sentiment about making sure that applicants understand, you know, have a proper expectation for the, the risks and the difficulties and the challenges of, of presenting all the evidence they need to present to, to make a proper case for a variance request. And that is, um, I, I hope we're making some effort to brief applicants the way we briefed the committee last month as well, so that they understand, um, you know, that hardship appears to be a, a much more narrow concept than, than we've understood it to be in the past. I think that's kind of been settled in that decision to some degree. There may be some debate about whether or not it's actually been settled. Maybe it needs to be litigated more to create a broader range of precedents. I think our uh, council advised us last month these things can tend to go a variety of ways. So one case doesn't make a thread of, of, of precedence, but uh, 
uh, but it, 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 it certainly brings a lot of clarity as to, as to what we need to be considering in our debates. And, um, and I, I really appreciate the professionalism of staff that brought about uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the result of, uh, of that case that we heard last month, too. So. I, I do. I, I'd echo that. And I know Steve Mishu's here. Roger, Rebecca's had to leave for another engagement. But, and then uh, Penny setting up the pre-variance meetings are a very vital part of this. So before anybody comes to you, they have talked to various Metro people. I mean, you saw in this first case today all the back and forth. And I do know that uh, sometimes those are difficult dif uh, conversations with people to tell them about the narrow definition of hardship. The economic aspect of that is what generally gets promoted. But um, I do think that these meetings are a lot more productive because of all the pre-meetings that go on, which is in no, in no small part due to the direction we've received from the committee over the years. So uh, I know they work hard on that and get those scheduled, and, and it has been uh, productive. I will add that before any case comes before you guys, we've had at least two internal or two, two meetings, either with the applicant or an internal before it even comes to the committee. So at least two. So I have another question for legal then, and this is not any discussion of the prior case, okay? This is just something that came up that I, that I have a question about. So when you read uh, to us, whatever you read about material increase or flood elevation increase, was that part of the stormwater ordinance or part, or part of the zoning code or? Part of the stormwater ordinance. Okay. Um, I guess I'm still unclear. I mean, so based upon that, we, are, we don't have the ability to grant any increase, right? So is that something that should be changed? Changed in the code? Yeah, I mean, there's there something that should be changed to give us the ability to grant a, an increase. Um, and, and the reason I say that, you know, let's say they're going to build a new baseball stadium downtown, or, or maybe it's an area that there's no one that lives around it, okay? And there's maybe a material increase in elevation, but it doesn't affect anyone. There's nobody developed around it. Seems like the committee should be able to give, have the, the ability to, to, to look at that and make an, an evaluation based upon that. So is there, should we change the, the zoning code or the stormwater code in order to allow us to have that flexibility? So- Because right now I think you're telling us we don't, yeah, right? Yeah, that's correct. So the the- the way the code, the chapter of the code that deals with stormwater is written right now, another section of that, section 100, I believe it is, talks about your ability to grant, to, to hear appeals and variances. And it talks about you can grant variances from the stormwater regulations, not from the code itself. I mean, it doesn't say not from the code itself, but that's implied because it just says you can grant variances from the regulations, period. I'm going to um, take a stab at something, and I'm sure either legal or Tom or Roger will probably. Well, I, I, I think even a better example would be you're doing a new subdivision out in a rural area somewhere. You're establishing a hundred elevation. You go to a crossing. It's going to be almost impossible. But I think that language was sort of intentionally adopted within the last few years, actually, because the there was a co policy concern that, like, if if council adopts something as a part of the code, then council should change that if they want it changed. I think the process, if somebody were to do something, if, if this applicant really wanted to really invest the time and energy, I think he would apply for variances over here for uncompensated fill, and then he'd probably be working with uh, FEMA in, in some form of uh, a, a letter of map change. Yes. That, Does that sound about right, Roger? If it was warranted. Uh, but and, and, I, and I know there's language within our regulations that calls out the no rise. And so that goes into the, if you're a modeler, you, you know that you can calculate rises uh, and it's gone to the point of uh, sufficiently far into that process to say what constitutes no rise. And so the state of Tennessee, through our state NFIP coordinator, Amy Miller, will tell you that no rise in, in the state of Tennessee under her, under her watch um, is, is nothing greater than 0 0.01 feet if you're below 0 0.01 feet, and then you could argue that, you know, how accurate is the model below the third, dec down to the third decimal point, um, that she won't agree that, that there's not been a rise if there's like 0 0.02. There's a rise associated with 0 0.02, it, albeit a small amount. So there's language in our regulations about no rise, uh, but there's also language 
in the Federal Register that, that governs our compliance with the National Flood Insurance Program, the NFIP. And in 44 CFR paragraph 60.6, which addresses specifically variances and exceptions, there's a clause in there um, under A1 that says variances shall not be issued by a community within any designated regulatory floodway if any increase in flood levels during the base flood discharge would result. So given that we have $150 million worth of flood coverage and there was, and there was one in 1.5 billion, $1.5 billion in coverage in, in the Nashville, Davidson County area, and there were $150, $153 million worth of flood claims processed uh, during the 2010 flood, we're not going to do anything that jeopardizes our standing in the National Flood Insurance Program. So we have to look at that language, and that's one of the conversations that Terry and I had at the beginning of our this meeting here today is, is this a rise in the floodplain, or is this a rise in the floodway? And, and unfortunately, you know, the, the, the fact that they purchased this property before we had this map completed, this modeling completed, if you will, um, is, is unfortunate. But, I mean, we have developers or even just individual homeowners that come in over the years have come in and say, said, I have, I own a lot on an unstudied A zone. We, we may make them go to the core to, to find a, a base flood elevation, or if it's a development of some kind, we may make them do their own study. So the absence of an effective flood insurance rate map that, that, that specifically addresses the, the location of that parcel um, doesn't mean that, you know, just because we don't have a, a map segment doesn't mean we're not going to, as staff, require them to map their own segment. They, it was their map, their model, that established what that rise was. So they, they modeled it, they indicated that they had modeled it, and, and indicated that there was a rise as a result of their model, and, and that, that by itself goes to the fact that they had established that there was floodplain there, so. Roger, I think you're more autistic than I am. And I'm pretty autistic. So, um, I was autistic, exactly. <laughs> uh, all engineers probably are. You know, you, you give me a problem, I have to solve it. But, or maybe he's autistic too. But, but I, I promise you, there's going to be a situation that comes up. Either Metro government's going to be building something or, or someone's going to need to do something, and it's going to be almost impossible to do a non rise. And so, I, I think that it should be looked at. If I'm in a rural area again, and there's no established floodplain, but I do a flood study and I've established a floodplain, I do a bridge crossing, it's not affecting anybody, I don't know why I would have to have an exact no rise on that. So uh, I'm gonna think about it a little bit, but I think that there needs to be some language in here to provide this committee with the flexibility. Uh, I think we're experts enough to determine whether or not uh, this is going to have a, a, a negative impact on insurance rates or, or flooding downstream. So, if I might append one other mm -hmm. comment to what Roger was saying, we did meet with FEMA to go over these panels. I was fortunate enough to sit in on that. And one thing I'd pass along that I found interesting, of course, Roger and Tom, they have national standing on some of these national flood plain manager groups and, and they're all over this. But one of the things that the FEMA folks mentioned that was important and asked us to emphasize to, to those we deal with, and, and probably something for you to know, um, there's a lot of thought on development about being in or out of the floodplain such that you either do or do not have to get flood insurance. And the concept that they really promoted to us to promote going forward is that it's really more of can you get your insurance rates reduced than get them eliminated because they deal with a lot of instances where people seemingly work very hard to get to a point where they don't have to have flood insurance only to later be flooded and that creates some very uh, negative circumstances. But um, I just wanted to pass that on. The other issue is too, we're always looking at development from the front end about to happen to you know how how the permitting can be issued, it's interesting when you're with those folks because they're looking at from the uh, uh, sort of actuarial end of the national flood insurance program and making sure they manage the risk of letting people get into situations where they make may make floodplain claims. So that it's kind of divergent things come into play, but. Uh, 
I know I appreciate Roger and Tom having the standing they do. I think it really helps us and helps citizens of Metro in ways probably that, that's not fully understood. Where are we? <laughs> I think Anna just asked my answer my own question. And so I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask this again. So if I have a large piece of property, I need to do this, okay? Because I am autistic, all right? So if I have a large piece of property and, and I raise the elevation within my property, but I don't effectively change the elevation on either side of my property, then I don't have to. I mean, is the ordinance written, is the stormwater ordinance written in a, in a manner so that, that that's okay? If it's within my, if it's within confines of my own property, we we we've allowed stuff like that. Like okay. In a, like if uh, just say we're on Sulphur Creek and mm -hmm. somebody was building a house and they're going to they're going to build this a uh, small culvert or bridge or some sort. Whatever the crossing right. is, if the rise is only on their property and they're balancing the cut and fill, right? And we'll, we'll we'll try to do whatever whatever okay. is reasonable. So we have the flexibility to deal with that within the confines of our own property. We we will Generally. look at those right. with a little bit more. Peace. Okay. Um, yeah. All right. That helps me. It helps me be at peace. <laughs> <laughs> so y'all can go home. Maybe. You have a motion Unless there, you bring Mr. up Bill. another question, and then I might be stuck here I, a little I, bit longer. I, I believe there's a motion on the floor to approve changes, <laughs> the proposed changes, and uh, we've had our discussion. With that, let's take a vote. All those in favor of the proposed changes, say aye. 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 None, none opposed before the proposed changes uh, are approved. And I will put a motion on the floor to adjourn. <laughs> I'll second that. All right. <laughs> Got a motion to adjourn. All those in favor say aye. 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 I'm opposed, seeing none. All right, thanks guys, see you next month. That was the strongest <laughs> eye of the day right there. <laughs>